Okay. I think it's we're live recording. So we have Lucas today about the Gaussian formalism. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um yeah, so the goal is to introduce the techniques to describe both bosonic and fermionic Gaussian states in a unified um, kind of framework that is based on so-called Keller structures. So a triangle of um, a symplectic form, um, a positive definite metric, and a so-called linear complex structure. So often I kind of draw that in the form of a triangle where we have a symplectic form, symplectic form omega, um, a positive definite um, bilinear form that's symmetric, uh, called a metric, no? like a positive definite inner product. And then uh, thrown in on top is the object that is kind of sits in the center because it really unifies both bosons and fermions. Um, and that's the so-called linear complex structure. Um, and I should say that um, all three together, satisfying some compatibility conditions, are known as uh, kind of um, parallel. Well, if, if a manifold has something like that, um, satisfying some conditions, it's called a Keller manifold. If a vector space has three of these structures in a compatible way, uh, it's called um, a Keller space. And um, so sometimes people refer to having all three of them as having a Keller structure. They sometimes abuse notation a little bit and just say, these are the three Keller structures that kind of come together, linear complex structure, symplectic form. Um, maybe I should add that here. Um, and no trick. Um, okay. So with that, I will um, go to, uh, I will maybe go to the next page. Okay. And I will um, just... Lucas, your sound is a bit clearer if you're away from the mic. So when you're writing, the, the sound moves a little bit. Okay. Just like, like this is okay. good. This yeah, just, otherwise this... I can also try to use headphones because I'm working on a touch screen. Just just let me know how it is. And like this is okay. If you go too close, then yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. So um the first part is introducing a little bit of notation, and then I want to introduce the so-called um, abstract index notation. So um this is something that's uh very heavily used in uh, general relativity, um, but also some other fields, generally high energy theory. Um, and it's not so much used in quantum information, but I believe that for uh, dealing with Gaussian states and having this classical phase space, it's very natural to use the so-called abstract index notation. So what, what is that about? If we have a vector space V, and um, in our case, this vector space V will be isomorphic to uh, to the 2N. And here, uh, N will turn out later to be the number of degrees of freedom, uh, or also called number of modes, bosonic modes or fermionic modes. Um, so it's a 2N dimensional real vector space. Um, and whenever you have a vector space, then of course you also automatically have the dual vector space, dual. And then we can introduce so-called RS tensors. Huh? So the spaces of RS tensors. And what is an RS tensor? Well, it's a multilinear map, namely it's uh, taking the dual vector space R times 
um, and taking the vector space itself, S times. Um, and we want to have a map to R, no? and we want it to be multilinear, so it should be um, linear in each component. So it's an object that eats R dual vectors and S vectors and spits out um, uh, real num in a linear way. Now, the space of such tensors is often written T uh, S or B. And, and just looking at some examples, the space of one zero tensors is really just the vector space. Why is that? Uh, well, if R is one and S is zero, we clearly have a linear map from the dual vector space onto R, right? if we just have a single dual vector space. And we know that for finite dimensional vector spaces, linear maps on the dual vector spaces, so to say, the dual of the dual is the vector space itself. So uh, that's um, uh, one zero tensors. Then we also have zero one tensors. And that's not very surprisingly, uh, linear maps from the vector space to R. And that's exactly the definition of the dual vector space. Now, another very important uh, example is um, one one vector spaces, uh, uh, tensors. And that is nothing else. Uh, that, does anybody have an idea? What, what, what are one one tensors uh, commonly denoted by if we think of them? Uh, so, like a matrix? Well, all of them. Uh, Anything that has kind of uh, uh, two indices, uh, essentially where the upper and the lower is um, uh, to two, can be represented as a matrix. Uh, so, so more mathematical. What, what, what is it? If it's uh, what, what type of matrix? What does it represent? Nobody cheating. Well, okay, I'm just referring to a linear map, no? which is a di different to a matrix that, for example, represents yeah, okay. a linear form. So it's it's a map from the vector space to the vector space because mapping um, vector into dual vector can be reinterpreted as eating a vector and spitting out a map from the dual to the reals which is the same as spitting out a vector. So um, one one tensors are linear maps from the vector space onto the vector space. But of course, we can also swap to the dual, just reinterpreting what the tensor does. And therefore, it's equivalently also linear maps from the dual vector space onto the dual vector space. And of course, in, in math, uh, basic linear algebra, we distinguish between these things uh, often and it's called um, one, the linear map. Let's call that the linear map M. And this we would call the adjoint linear map that is kind of the induced one that acts on the dual vector space. But as a tensor, it kind of manifestly shows that it's it's the same mathematical object. Yeah? So, so we just standardize them to be written as uh, as such tensors. Any any questions on that? Well, or is it just basic repetition for, for you? Uh, okay. okay. If not uh, with the notation that you first have R times the dual. Yes. And in the TRS notation of the tensor space. I think T1 of zero would be taking one dual space, was it? Uh, uh, T, yes, yeah, yeah. So so, so, so uh, I, I kind of try to indicate it here. Now the upper one is R and the lower one is S. And so yeah, it, it is important that if you have a single dual space as here, because you move to R, 
the, the tensor is not the dual, but the vector space itself. No? The tensor is the dual of the vector space. So a one zero tensor yeah. is just a vector. Um but um but the T one zero would be the collection of one zero tensors. Yeah. But one zero tensors, I think in your notation is the dual and no V. I... Exactly. It, it it it's it's a linear map from the dual to the real numbers. And that's exactly what a vector does. Uh Okay, yeah. It, 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 it's important that, that here we're talking about maps. Yeah, so, okay, so you, you talk about maps and then the domain kind of flips. Exactly, exactly. Okay. The, whenever you have a linear map from the vector space onto the real numbers, that's linear, that's a dual vector. While a linear map from the dual space onto the real numbers, that's a vector. And 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 so on. Okay, perfect. So I mentioned that I somehow want to introduce abstract index notation, but so far I've been not really many indices. So let me correct that and tell you a little bit about how we represent them. Namely, um, um, if we have an RS tensor. We can write it with a so-called abstract index notation where we have some name. Let's say our tensor T uh, is a small letter T. That, that's the name of the tensor. And now we want to have a nice way to indicate what type of tensor it is. And for that, we prescribe a number of indices. So we have other indices as many as there are um, um, so, uh, so-called vector or uh, covariant indices. So, so, so that's um, as many as, as we have here, um, essentially, uh, R. And then we have additional S level indices, which I call here B uh, up to S. So a general tensor will have the indices and S lower indices. And the very important thing here is that um, these indices are abstract index indices. Um, they are really part of the name. So uh, yeah, I, I just say these are covariant. And that's parenthesis vector indices. And um, then I have um, contravariant um, oh, maybe well it's it, it maybe a little bit depends on the conventions sometimes people also refer to contravariant and covariant maybe in uh, in different uh, conventions so maybe let me just let's rather than using covariant and contravariant let me just use um, vector and dual vector indices i think this is uh, this is more natural in terms of uh, notation. So these are uh, vector indices. Oh, oh, okay, I, I need to clean up a little bit. I think that's a bit cleaner. Uh, so, so these are vector indices and these are dual vector indices, okay? So they are really part of the name um, and they are not labels of, let's say, entries of a matrix representation. Even though we will see, we can always represent such a tensor as a multilinear um, um, array, 
where these indices become true indices to represent a specific tensor by an array of numbers. Yeah? And um, just again, to give some example, a uh, vector would have just a single upper index. So clearly this is an element of one zero and that's nothing else than the vector space. While a dual vector would be have a single lower indices, so that's clearly in T one, no, sorry, uh, in T zero one, which is the dual vector space. And the important part is that we can use the indices to do pairings, no? because we remember that um, a vector it's a dual vector. A dual vector uh, eats, um, is, 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 is a linear map on the vector space. So clearly, we can co combine a vector and a dual vector to get a real number. And that's done by, by contraction. Yeah? So um, VA, uh, sorry, no, uh, VA, WA, is a real number. And what this um, kind of doubling of a repeated index represents is a contraction. Well, um, contraction. Well. Uh, 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 fraction. And this is again. Um, of course, reminiscent of the Einstein summation convention that one uses if one were to represent the vector and the dual vector um, as um, a list of real numbers with respect to a given basis. But here, mathematically, it's really just telling you that um, we put the dual vector into the open slot of the vector. Now, if we remember that a vector was a linear map from the dual vector space to the real numbers, so then V of W just gives you the respective real number when we apply V to W. But equivalently, we can also interpret that as W applied to V because we remember that W was a linear map from the vector space to the real numbers. Yeah. And uh, rather than arguing about um, do, do we stick W into the slot of uh, V or do we uh, put V into the slot of W, um, we just have this pairing of um, a vector and a dual vector index. Yeah? Um, then if we have a linear map W, um, M, um, which has an upper and a lower index, no? that was an element of the 1-1 one, one tensor. Um, clearly, we can interpret M as being a linear map from the vector space to the vector space that essentially maps a vector V to a new vector that's given by A, B, where the lower index is contracted away. But equivalently, we can also think of the MAB as a linear map from the dual vector space to the dual vector space, where we have um, uh, the dual vector WA that is mapped to MAB. Um, where we now again contract B away, but uh, now a lower index um, remains. And again, these uh, indices here we really just keep as a book, uh, use as a bookkeeping device that first tells us what type of tensor we are looking at. Is it a vector? Is it a dual vector? And so on. And as a bookkeeping device, when we combine tensors, how we um, um, one object into the slot of, of other tensors. No? Uh, any questions on that? Does does that all make sense? Very basic. Okay. Not so much feedback. So, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 
Um, so in all that you wrote down, you always think of A and B as those abstract vector or or dual Actually, vector. Dual Sorry, the, the vector is is the the name that we have. So the dual vector W, for example, or the vector V in in a small V here here in in these examples. Yeah, and so the indices they are like summation indices or um, other indices that you you can think of um, in the sense that you can completely replace them by other letters. No? Like you can call them A, B, and so on, depending on what is convenient. Just if you have equations, then of course they need to match on both sides of the equations. Because that essentially tells you what are the corresponding slots. So when, when you speak of the summation, so no, no, there, there, there's no summation here. There's no summation, right? So when you write... And you're saying in a summation, you can always change the the name of the index that you use. And in the same way, you can always change the name of the abstract index. No? So uh, essentially what, what I'm saying, the vector w, uh, VA and VB, they're both the same vector. No? But of course, if I have an equation that goes like XA, is equal to um, VA, then I cannot change the index on the two sides of the equation independently because they need to indicate the same slot on both sides. But of course, this equation I can equivalently write as XB equal VB. No? That's, that's the idea. Um, and what is typically used is that one agrees on certain alphabets. So uh, here I typically use the small letter Latin alphabet for the classical phase space when I deal with Gaussian states. Um, if one has tensors on several vector spaces, that happens, I mean, not, not in this context of uh, Gaussian states. Um, it, it may happen if one wants to treat bosons and fermions at the same time, and that's something that Robert is familiar with. Um, when one wants to somehow uh, do uh, a unified approach of a system of both bosonic and fermionic degrees of freedom, um, then one has essentially two copies of these vector spaces, uh, uh, potentially even with different dimensions, you know, if the, the degrees of freedom of bosons and fermions are, are different. And in that case, one could use for one uh, Latin letters and for the other one Greeks, Sometimes one also uses a point to, to indicate a uh, uh, different um, uh, type of, of tensor. No? So, so for example, um, uh, VA dot is sometimes used to describe spinners. There are various ways to, one can use this abstract index notation, um, but um, yeah, one, one just needs to agree on an alphabet usually. Does, does that answer the question? Mm, so the uh, the abstract index notation pertains to to somehow organizing maps. While if I would have like the the Einstein indices and so on, then I would be talking about the entries of of the arrays. Exactly, exactly. So so if if you're thinking of the object as being uh, written in abstract index notation, the the point is that the idea is that. The symbol, including the index, refers to the abstract object, the, the mathematical object that you're dealing with, such yeah. as a, a linear form, a linear map, or a so, well, so in the, in this framework, I was wondering when 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 you had the contraction. Yeah. So you said you said that the the abstract indices are parts of the name of the tensor. Yeah. So on on the previous uh, slide. You wrote, for example, the contraction of V with W. Yes. So those indices, sh should I still view them as the name of the contraction of the of the tensor coming from contraction, or is and this so, already the summation? Um. So contracted indices, they are still part of the notation, but they indicate that the object does not have this specific property anymore. So if you have an upper and a lower index that matches, you have a zero, zero 
and so on, not because you don't have so, so in in this notation here to the right uh, to, to to the left, sorry, this here, that is only uh, the uncontracted indices. If you have contracted indices, such as in the above example, there is no uncontracted index. Therefore, you can think of it as a zero zero tensor, huh? and a zero zero tensor. Exactly. It's yeah. essentially a map from nothing to the real numbers. So this is really just the real numbers, which is exactly what I wrote here. That um, yeah. Uh, so a, a fully contracted index um, uh, tensor is really just a result of the respective contractions, which is a real number here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So so fakes are exactly. So so if we apply a linear map M A B to a vector B. Then these indices are contracted. Of course, this is the same as in a, and here using the C instead, because you can you the, the, the um, contracted indices just tell you how you pair sumos. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, those yeah. two can change. So this is the entry in your notation of T zero one probably right? No. This yes. is the... this would be just a vector. This would be T one zero because there's a single free upper index left, namely the A. Okay. Because the other ones are contracted indices. Yeah. And and so you have the 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 names of the tensor with the abstract indices, which is part of the name of the tensor. And then you add the, the idea of contraction. Which is a way of producing new tensors. So that's exactly. what you're describing. And then then this A B stuff, you just gave a rule to, to know which order of the tensor, yeah. Exactly. Yes. And then the contraction for now, you didn't define it as summation, but it's more like the composition of the maps. So it's right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, so that mean, describes it... how to compose them. And then when we evaluate it, we do it by summation, but that's a different story, I guess. You keep it separate, though. Yeah, I mean, in many situations, you can prove lots of relations and don't need to do um, need to do any summation. Uh, like, uh, yeah, I mean, while you're just dealing with mathematics, um, you, you don't need to represent things in a specific basis at all. Um, right. But, but yes, of course, if you actually want to do calculations for a specific Gaussian state in a given basis, then you would represent uh, everything with respect to that basis. And then the indices become um, not regular indices. And in that case, you would not um, represent a mathematical object anymore but the components of the tensor or the vector. And depending on the notation, you either change letter, uh, some people uh, also uh, just underline the letter. So V A underlined then refers to a collection of real numbers, for example, as the components of the vector with, with a given basis. And the point is, uh, is uh, for a large part, we will actually never need to uh, deal with um, representing things in a given basis. And it's it's remarkable how many things and properties you can prove just within um, uh, this, this completely basis independent formalism. All right, let's go for that. <laughs> okay. Um, so at that stage, let me emphasize that uh, there are specific tensors and objects that um, that are unique. So so uh, specific, let's let's call them special special uh, tensors. And here I will most uh, tensors and operations. So we already saw the contractions. Um, now there is one special tensor that is the Kronecker delta A B. Uh, that is um, that that has the property that if I contract it with um, any other object, um, I just get out the object itself just with with the respective new letter. So. Um, essentially, the Kronecker delta does not change um, a vector index, but we can also apply that uh, to a dual vector. Um, so here, for example, 
um, uh, let's uh, do W A, then this is nothing else than uh, well, well or omega omega B. Huh? Um, and of course, mathematically, what this Kronecker delta is, it represents the um, the identity map. No? So uh, represents. The identity map either from the vector space onto the vector space, that's what I indicated here, or the identity map from the dual vector space onto the dual vector space. That's what I represented here. And of course, both of them are um, the same tensor, so to say. Now, uh, something very important to emphasize is that Kronecker delta AB does not exist. Does that make sense for, for everybody that you cannot define such an object uh, without making reference to a basis or introducing a new object? There is no, if you have a vector space, there is no canonical bilinear form on that vector space that one could call Kronecker delta. So that would be a two zero two object, or this would be a zero two zero two tensor. Yes, but what I'm saying that there is no such object that's canonically defined for any vector space. What what does it mean? Well, the, the, uh, mm. The Kronecker delta as a linear map with an upper and a lower index there, I, I showed or explained that that's the identity map which you have defined for any vector space. But I'm saying there is no such object that, that has these properties that, that, that you could define. I mean, essentially, what I want to emphasize is that if you were to describe things in a given basis, there you could have by linear form that is represented by the identity matrix in this given basis. But if you yeah. change basis, it will not be the identity matrix anymore if it's a bilinear form. Well, if it's a linear map, if I change basis, it will always be the identity matrix. Therefore, the identity matrix representing a linear map is a basis independent object. The identity matrix representing a bilinear form is not something that's basis independent and therefore there does not exist a corresponding basis independent canonically defined tensor of course you can introduce such an object and we will do that often where we introduce an object glb and we don't call it conica delta because this is a new object that is not canonically defined in the in a way the identity map is always there we, we don't need to make a choice well, if we want to put an inner product on a vector space, we need to make an additional choice by defining um, positive definite bilinear form here, GAB. Okay. Then, given linear map, um, let's say KAB we can define its trace. And this is just contracting the indices of the linear map with itself. Yeah? That, that's the trace. In a similar way, we can also define the determinant of a linear map, which is an object that's basis independently defined. Uh, one can define it through contractions with a completely anti-symmetric tensor. Um, but essentially what I'm telling you here is just the determinant of a linear map is defined basis independently, and therefore we can define the determinant uh, just uh, in, in, in this basis independent way. Yeah, so, so, so I just refer to it as the determinant but, of it. And just for completeness, a basis independent definition means that you take a matrix and you contract the same matrix to all indices or 
So you didn't define basis transformations and so on. Yeah, I mean, here, here I'm really alluding to your knowledge of linear algebra, that you know that, um, or, or maybe I just want to emphasize it again, that you recall it, that a linear map on the vector space has a determinant that's independent from the basis that you represent it as a matrix. And of course, uh, typically the way you, you calculate the determinant is by representing the linear map in a given basis and then calculating the determinant of that matrix. There is also a basis independent definition that, that I was just kind of briefly mentioning by certain contractions with an anti-symmetric tensor. But, um, but yeah, I, I just want to emphasize uh, that we can define the determinant of a linear map just by calling it determinant, and that's then an object that's uh, um, um, uh, that that gives you a real number. So often we would drop the indices in that case to not confuse them. To, that that you don't think that they are kind of open indices. So often we just write determinant of k and don't have any uh, indices anymore because the determinant kind of kills the the um, tensor properties of, of it. it. It just gives a real number. And in a similar way, we may just write trace of K being equal to K, maybe. No? Now, uh, for analytical functions, We can define f of k, a, b, and uh, this is a, what what it tells you is that um, you can apply a function to a linear map and you get out a new linear map. And there are two ways to define them. And then, so for, for analytical functions, it's it's the same. Um, either through power series or through um, um, eigenvector decomposition. No, uh, so so here the statement, I mean, just, just as an example, uh, the exponential map of K you can uh, we can really just write as the sum over one over n factorial n where we have um, uh, k to the n a b uh, and so here we can also use abstract index notation and what do i mean by that well i mean by that that i have uh, a delta a b plus uh, k a b plus one half k a c k c b plus and so on uh, where of course this object here is nothing else than uh, the linear map k squared which is a, again a linear map and in a similar way uh, if my um, matrix uh, if my linear map k is diagonalizable. So uh, for diagonalizable linear maps, uh, K, A, B, what does it mean that, that it's diagonalizable? Well, the statement is I can write it as um, a sum over I, where I have um, uh, eigenvectors EI. So the, the, here the I is not an abstract index, it's really a name of the eigenvectors. Um, and each eigenvector, because it's an eigenvector, it has an upper index because that's uh, because it's a vector. And then I have um, the dual eigenvectors that I can call EI star, because they are dual vectors, I have uh, a, a linear index, 
and then I have eigenvalues lambda, and then I can define f a a b by just applying my function to all the individual eigenvalues. And that gives me also a unique definition um, of um, how I can apply functions, um, general functions that they, in principle, don't even need to be analytical. Um, and, and I can apply them to diagonalizable uh, linear maps. And of course, if my linear map is diagonalizable and my function is analytical, the two definitions, so here, this was the Pyro series definition, and uh, this one was the um, um, value decomposition. Uh, both of them will turn out to be equivalent. Yeah? And what I want to emphasize is that, for example, if you have a bilinear form, GAB, then there does not exist a trace of G no? doesn't exist because you cannot contract to lower indices. Similarly, if you have um, uh, bilinear form here with two linear indices, there does not exist a function F of K. Like there, there, there is no way, an easy way to apply a function to K and you get out again a bilinear form. In particular, the power series wouldn't make sense because you cannot concatenate. No, like you cannot put K A B and then K C D. No, you cannot con contract B and C. It doesn't work. Yeah? Uh, so uh, you, you cannot multiply bilinear forms with each other to get a new bilinear form in an easy way, which you can do for linear maps by kind of putting one in, into the slot of, of the next one. Yeah? And so therefore, it, it matters to be aware of what type of, um, of, um, of pencil we are considering. Any, any questions at, at that stage? Not so much. Yeah. So, with that, I um, maybe I I'll, I'll, I'll just save um, the notes and I will go to the lecture notes. So so the things that I described so far is really what I um, what I had in uh, in the appendix of the lecture notes. So let me. So here, abstract index notation and special operations. It's it's explained here. Um, eigenvalues, um, uh, trace, determinant, and so on. Um, we now go to the definition of a classical phase space, because in order to turn our vector space V into um, a classical phase space, we will need to add an additional structure, namely either a symplectic form omega and a positive definite metric G. So let me let me uh, go back to the whiteboard. Uh, so so this is uh, kind of uh, now now um, classical theory. Um, v, which I already said is isomorphic to a two n dimensional real vector space, is called a bosonic or fermionic phase space. Um, if and only if equipped 
with the following. Um, so for the bosonic case, um, I have a symplectic form omega a b. Um, and for the fermionic case, so that's boson, um, uh, metric G A B. And let's kind of just make emphasize them. Um, so that's fermions. Um, and we recall the property of a um, symplectic form. So that's really saying uh, that it's um, anti-symmetric and non-degenerate. And the metric is supposed to be um, symmetric and positive definite. And here it's really the, the standard um, um, properties that, that you know. So um, uh, I guess uh, so, uh, omega a b is supposed to be minus omega b a. That's um, anti-symmetric. And that's in abstract symbol notation still? Or? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, we, we will not need to use any, any anything else. No, like this, this really just says that if you swap the two suits. Um, what does it mean to swap them? Well, that um, you stick in another, the, the objects in, in reverse order. No, like I mean, we, we, uh, so we, we call that omega a b is a map from vector space vector space hmm. to real numbers, and uh -huh. so this this notation. I mean, what that means is that omega a b, and if I plug in a vector x and a vector y, no, yeah. but this is the same as minus. Omega A B and then Y X B, which I can then of course um um um, um, um swap in it by by writing this as uh, as calling it um minus omega um so so I swap the names of the two, then I have B A. So I have here uh, Y B and X A. And then of course, um, whenever I have the tensor, the order in which I write these objects don't matter. No? So this is of course the same as omega uh, B A um, um, X A Y B. Oh, and, and of course, what, what I'm just telling here you is that at the beginning, I put X into the first slot and Y into the second. That I get minus the real number if I put X into the second slot and Y into the first. So it's, it's a completely basis independent description of anti-symmetry. Uh, so, so because for any x and y vectors it holds, then the maps are equal with the minus then, yeah? Exactly, exactly. Okay, no, uh, I asked because, um, you know, I want to see the power of, of the index notation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's different than just to say I, I view it as an array and I, I swap. That is correct. Yeah. It's yeah. really a statement about properties of of a map and the, of a multilinear map, and that that's what a tensor is. I mean, in in the same way, you can then describe a completely symmetrized tensor if you have many indices that essentially, when you apply it to n vectors, that um, 
interchanging any two, the sign doesn't change, then it's completely symmetric, or the sign does change, then it's completely anti-symmetric, which we will see um, probably at the beginning of next time when we introduce uh, kind of uh, the fermionic um, observables, which are completely anti-symmetric because they're Grassmannian. Um, uh, you know, and, and of course, we can also tell um, what the requirement is for omega to be non-degenerate, and that is that uh, omega a b contracted with a vector x b is not the zero dual vector. No? So here um, we would be left with a single lower index. Um, and we require that this is the case for all x b that's non-zero. Uh, that, that, that's one standard way to describe uh, non-degeneracy. So, so do you need to write zero sub a or? No. Typically, for zero, we just write zero, and one knows what it, uh, okay. what it means without having an index. Theoretically, one one could do that, but yeah, I mean, it's 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 uh, when dealing with so so, so I, I I will show later that often we kind of also drop the abstract index notation again. Um, to, to have kind of a notation that is a bit sleeker, but that only works if you're uh, dealing with two tensors. Um, we, 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 we will see that in the, uh, at, the, at, the, at the later point. Um, but it's still good to always know how to go back to the standard abstract index notation. Yeah. Um, so, so that was the symplectic form, um, of course, for the uh, metric, we have that um, GAB is GBN, so that's symmetry. And then we want that it's positive definite, and of course that's uh, that's the standard way that we require that X uh, A X B uh, is larger um, or equal to zero, um, where um, the um, the equality to zero only applies to the zero vector. Huh? Uh, so that's positive, definite. Okay, so having, having uh, just recalled that, so uh, essentially for bosons, we have a pair vector space with symplectic form, and for fermions, we have V with GAB. Now, because omega is non-degenerate and G is positive definite, um, they both automatically come with their inverses. So um, here we have inverses. And they are now not inverses as linear maps, but a little bit more abstractly defined, uh, namely, um, uh, I introduced the inverse of omega as being a capital omega. Uh, so this is a, a bilinear form on the dual phase space, not because it has two upper indices, so it's like two vector indices, so it would eat two dual vectors, W, A, and V, B, that would give a real number, for example. And so this I define as an inverse by the following property, such that um, omega A, C, omega C, B is the chronic delta on the vector space. And of course, there is a way to understand that as a, as a linear map, namely, we can think of omega a b as um, eating a vector and spitting out a dual vector. No? So we can think of this either as a linear form on the vector space or as a map from the vector space to the dual vector space. And if we think of this linear map, then omega can be understood as the respective inverse, no? as the uh, map that um, that 
it's a dual vector and um, spits out a vector. And in fact, any such bilinear forms, as long as they are non-degenerate, actually provides you with an isomorphism between the vector space and its dual, exactly by this construction of these maps. Uh, and we can do exactly the same. So that, that was for uh, bosons. We can do the same for fermions. So we define the inverse metric, which I use here capital letter, such that GAB contracted with the little guy. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I use C, and that's pure convention. Um, CB, that this again is Kronika Delta AB. And again, that, that's a basis independent way to describe um, the properties of, of these inverses. Um, that means whenever we have our classical phase space, bosonic or fermionic, we automatically also have the dual phase space equipped with a dual bilinear form omega AB. And similarly, um, for fermions, we have the dual phase space and an inverse metric, capital G. And often I will not even talk about what's the metric and what it's in inverse. I will just have capital and lower level letter omega and G. Um, and I think we're coming soon to an end. I will um, very briefly just um, in, in, well, give an additional name, namely whenever we have a phase space, we have so-called linear observables. Observables. And if we have a vector uh, x in our phase space, then not very surprisingly, um, an obs a linear observable is any element um, uh, w a in the dual phase space, huh? because that's exactly what is linear. So these are the observables, the, the linear observables. So any, any dual vector, regardless of uh, if, if it's bosonic or fermionic, they are called the linear observables. And of course, uh, there are two n independent linear observables for any system with n degrees of freedom, because for a finite dimensional vector space, the dimension of the dual vector space is the same as the vector space itself. Um, and now, from the linear observables, we find the algebra of classical observables. So algebra of classical observables. And um, for that, we um, we essentially have the symmetric algebra generated for by V star for bosons. And we have the Grassmann algebra generated by V star for fermions. So what, what do I mean by that? Well, um, I can describe a general observable as um, um, as a collect as essentially as a map on uh, so, so so for bosons, I can think of it really just as a map on the classical phase space. So I have um, I can write f of v where 
VA is an element of the vector space, and I can write this as a power series. I can write it as F0 plus F1 A VA plus um, F2 A B VA VB plus and so on. And I get um, a power series to arbitrary powers in B. Um, and I require I can either require or I see that, of course, by construction, this will be completely symmetric. Only the completely symmetric pieces of the ifs will matter because I contract them with um, an equal number of, um, of the same vector in the classical phase space. And therefore, any anti-symmetric part in uh, Fn will just vanish. So this will give me a, um, a, a power series expansion of a general observable in the case of a bosonic system. And of course, that is mathematically the same because it's symmetric to just having a symmetric element of the algebra. So, so, so the algebra um, um, if, if, if I have a vector space, how do I construct the algebra generated by it? Well, I take all the symmetrizations of it. So, so essentially, the, the algebra is a vector space that is spanned by the identity, the dual vector space, and then um, the tensor product of the um, um, dual vector space with itself, and then symmetrizing over it, and so on, up to arbitrary powers or arbitrary number of tensor products and uh, in the case so that that's for bosons in the case of fermions the algebra again we have um, the identity we have the dual phase space and then we anti-symmetrize all the tensor products over the dual phase space and that of course implies that this series will truncate at some point, namely we will have at most the sum of V star tensor product da, 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 tensor product with V star, um, where we have here two n copies. Because as soon as we have two n and one copy of that space, any element in there will be the zero element, uh, because um, um, at least one element must occur twice. And then anti-symmetry will ensure that uh, only the, the zero element will, will lie in there. Okay, yeah, I, I think that might be enough for the classical observables. Um, I, I will, would pick up here next week. Um, uh, maybe, maybe there's some questions on on anything why do you call them classical and not quantum is there a distinction to quantum oh yes we will quantize them such that, that then this algebra will be represented as elements on acting on a Hilbert space and very important we will deform the algebras so the classical so classical we have the symmetric algebra for bosons, and we have the Grassmann algebra for fermions. When we quantize, we will use the. I mean, we will. Um, we will go from the certainness. In a symmetric algebra, everything commutes. In a Grassmann algebra, everything anti-commutes. When we quantize, we want to implement commutation or anti-commutation relations. So we deform the symmetric algebra to the so-called vial algebra, where we enforce, and that, that's very important, the vial algebra does not now not just take the to uh, phase space into account, it also takes into account the symplectic form. For the classical observables, 
Uh, you don't need a symplectic form unless you want to define Poisson brackets on it, but the algebra itself stands on its own, just as the symmetric algebra um, generated by the dual phase space. While um, for the quantized version, the viral algebra enforces specific anti commutation rela uh, commutation relations in which they are, that is governed by the symplectic form on the classical. Um, um, I mean, on, on, on the dual phase space. And in a similar way, um, we will enforce anti-commutation relations uh, and therefore deform the Grassmann algebra to a so-called Clifford algebra that now similarly take not just the dual phase space, but also the GLB that will tell us what anti-commutation relations we actually want to implement. And we will see that next next week. Okay, so just to see if I understood the picture, you start the grass the, the Gaussian formalism and you, you basically say it will be basis independent, so it will be very tensorial. You start with the vector space, but then you make the distinctions through the symplectic or metric forms, right? Yeah. And what confused me is where so that that's me okay. and and then then you start imposing the the relations for observables so what i'm wondering about is um so some people sometimes say that fermions are all fermions are always quantum or something like this yes can you comment on that yeah there, there are people who say that the reason is that the quantum version is not very interesting, but you can, I mean, historically, fermions are interesting in the quantum version. There is no classical fermionic system that you would observe in the world, as far as I know. And so people were not so interested in describing non-existing systems with Grassmann algebras, while the symmetric algebras that, I mean, uh, I didn't mention that so much, but of course, here, this symmetric algebra up here, um, you would put a norm on it and then um, go from uh, essentially uh, infinite power series. Um, you look for observables that can be written as, uh, as the, the limit with respect to some norm. No? So, so here, this function f, that you can expand as a power series, you can then of course complete the space of observables by, um, yeah, with respect to some some norm. And what you would arrive with at the end is, for example, um, C infinity functions on the classical phase space. Yeah, or sometimes I mean they could be uh, so, so, so they could be smooth observables um depending on on what you use for the completion of the space of, of the symmetric algebra uh, it could also be just one-time differentiable functions or, or something like that but, but in the end here the classical observable um, for bosons will be a map from the vector space to the real numbers well for um fermions um, it's really this that the full Grassmann algebra that is generated by by the dual phase space and it's it's not as as physical that that you would say oh I am my observable measures the position because even the observable that you get out of it will be I mean a Grassmann number there, there, there's no real numbers uh, except of course for the ones that's proportional to the identity, that those you can represent as a real number. So in 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 general, essentially, I'm I'm just showing you how to complete the quantum picture also on the classical side, but um, the classical part of fermions is not as interesting, um, but it's still relevant to. For, for Gaussian states, because you still have lots of things going on on the classical phase space. So it's it's the, the observables are not so important for the quantum theory, but the, the classical 
uh, dual face space and linear maps on it and bilinear forms such as the metric and so on, those you still need. And so it's kind of nice to have bosons and fermions described in a kind of unified or minimal or parallel of both bosons and fermions. And so understanding quantization as this deformation of the respective algebra by implementing commutation or anti-commutation relations respectively. All right. I think we will hear more about this anyway, no? Because when you will be quantizing, the, the face spaces will pop up, and, and I think maybe... Uh, yes, ab yeah. absolutely. We, we, we will see that explicitly next week. Yeah, I, um, I would be interested more in, in what you mean by the observables for the, the Grassmann variate observables and so on. So maybe, maybe this we can still discuss later. Yeah, but, sure. If you want to summarize still, go ahead. And otherwise we would be finishing the recording. Then I can click anytime you want. Um, yeah, I don't think I have. So so maybe, maybe I just go through very briefly. So yeah, I, yeah I'm motivated about Kerala stuff. Uh, I then spent quite a bit of time on this abstract index notation uh, that you can find in the appendix of the lecture notes. Uh, and then I finally, towards the end, came to part one of the series, or namely the definition of the classical theory, where I introduced um, the classical phase space being equipped with a symplectic form for bosons or a positive definite inner product, so-called a metric for fermions. Um, I just reviewed briefly what it means to be a symplectic form or a metric. And then I emphasize that whenever you have such a classical phase space, then of course you always have the dual vector space, uh, the dual phase space, and this dual phase space naturally is also equipped with an inverse or dual um, symplectic form or metric. And then in this last part, I introduced or emphasized that the um, dual phase space is nothing else than uh, the space of linear observables. And from linear observables, we can generate the full algebra of classical observables, which in the case of bosons is the symmetric algebra. In the case of fermions is the Grassmann algebra generated from V star. That's, that's it. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lucas.